from the penthouse to the streets to the homeless shelter with nothing. And nobody was coming to save me. Nobody was coming to help me. I was 12 or 13 years old and I started working at a bike store and I was molested consistently every day that I went to work. So that started that trauma, um, feeling lost, not knowing what to do, who to tell. And I think that trauma is what started the change where I needed to bury my feelings. Using the drugs gave me that escape, but I needed more drugs, you know, and drugs aren't cheap. And I needed to find a way to support that habit and support that lifestyle. I very quickly knew that I needed to be, become a part of something. At least I thought I did. I pulled up to my mom's house in a fancy new car. Um, you know, I had the ripped jeans and the dress jacket with the gold chains and uh, announced to her that I was gonna be a drug dealer. Initially, I was devastated, obviously. Uh, confused. I didn't understand why he would choose that. I thought he was, you know, why he would choose to go down that road when he had everything going for him. He had, he had love, he had support, he had, you know, parents that listened, parents that helped, uh, siblings that adored him. Um, I didn't understand. I still have a letter that I wrote him about how he was going down the wrong road and I was watching him, but he needed to come back down that road and go the other way and things would be the way that they were. I just wanted it to go back to the way that it was. Well, I was the mother, so I took responsibility. I, I thought it was my fault and I needed to fix what he was doing. It was no different than to me when he, you know, like any other kid, he took a chocolate bar from the candy store. I thought I could fix it. And I thought I could fix it for years. And I tried for years to fix it. And then I, I uh, you know, myself ended up in, in counseling and, and being taught that um, I couldn't fix it. It wasn't, it was bigger than I was. And so then I just did the best I could to be there for him. A matter of two weeks, I went from living in a one bedroom basement suite to having a brand new car, having a backpack full of money, gold chains, gold watch, gold rings, and living at the top of the Marriott in the penthouse in downtown Victoria, and it was two weeks. That's what made me fall for that life. I had this whole idea in my head of what it was like to be a drug dealer. You see music videos, you see TV, you know, and you think that that's what it's like, right? You watch movies. And uh, so I had this whole idea of what it was going to be to be a drug dealer and then to have somebody come up and um, want me to join a gang. Well, that's, man, that's just, it was like a music video happening in my life. I felt like I had arrived, you know? I'm going to show the world that I can do this. That exact feeling, that one lasted a few months, right? before I had to really start putting the work in. That's when things changed. I had a partner and um, I'll never forget, he went out one night to do a drug deal without me and he was murdered. Something went off in my head saying I needed more. If I was gonna continue to do this, I needed more. I needed protection, I needed people around me. I had to step out of my comfort zone. I had to use violence, you know. I had to do things I didn't wanna do. I was given a cell phone that I was told that I would answer when it rang and I would do whatever I was told to do. I didn't have the option anymore. At that point, drugs really started to take over. At that point, I started becoming an intravenous drug user. I was like 18, 19 years old, already 
you know, intravenous drug user, as well as multiple other drugs I was using daily. You know, that's really when the mess started because I wanted to drown out everything, but I also had to accomplish essentially goals that were set out for me to do. I'd do really good for a while and be what they would call a dealer. And then I would go back down because my drug usage would just go through the roof. I'd get incarcerated, you start all over again. I had a lot of uh, health problems, heart attacks, strokes. Anytime that would happen, you know, I'd start all over again. My place would get robbed. You know, it was consistently, it was just an up and down battle. My absolute bottom was in Thunder Bay, Ontario. It was uh, Christmas, Christmas Day 2018. I was living in a homeless shelter. I had the clothes on my back. I watched a guy OD in front of me. As they carted him away, I looked on the ground and saw a needle full of fentanyl and his blood inside it. And it didn't stop me. I picked up and I did it because I had nothing but an obsession for more drugs. Nothing else mattered to me. That exact moment after I did that shot, I knew I was at a rock bottom, a bottom that I had never seen before. I was stuck, <laughs> one of the coldest parts of Canada, away from everything I knew. And I just picked up a random needle off the ground because I had watched a guy OD on it and it was available and I needed to fill that obsession for drugs. I didn't recognize myself anymore. I didn't recognize my thoughts. That childhood that I had, that good childhood, it was nothing but a distant memory. You know, that one event that happened to me, you know, it still fueled a lot of uh, my pain. But there was so much new pain, so much agony, you know, on top of that. So much anger and frustration. Because here I was, you know, I went from being a kid with an idea because of what I thought was cool to being an adult in his, you know, in my mid-30s with that same idea, but it wasn't so cool anymore. I had nothing. I had nothing to show for. I had to close on my back. That was it. I think I had a pretty normal childhood. I always had anything I wanted. I never went hungry. I always had the newest of everything. Jumped out of his crib about nine months, never really walked. He just ran and he was into everything. He loved his sister. I can remember her, him taking her tobogganing and, and she fell off this one day and he very quickly got off, put her back on the toboggan and dusted the snow off her and, and then looked up to make sure I knew that he did that, right? He was, he was always very, always wanting to please. I came here when I was about uh, three weeks clean and um, I lived here until approximately nine, nine and a half months and um, it's a recovery house for all guys. It was like that lost kid was still inside of me, I just didn't know how to find him. And this gave me a chance to really work on myself and to be able to focus on myself and it gave me a chance to build relationships with other guys to support me um, and to build that mistrust that I had in humans. Up here I would sit, contemplate, think about everything, think about if I wanted to change my life. I'd call my family, you know, I'd talk to them. I would just breathe. It was just a place that I could come and be away from everybody and just um, have that time to really uh, reflect on my life and think about the choices that I was making. It was like one choice 
that in two weeks I thought I had made it to the top. It took me 20 years to recover from that one choice. 20 years of agony, 20 years of pain. It, it took me to get back to where I started in the beginning. And that was with nothing, you know, just, just a guy starting off. And um, it's, it's crazy to think how long it took me to find my way back. It was a change of everything that I had known over the past 20 years. You know, this was the start of me changing everything. It was the start of me starting over. I reached out for help. I asked for help. I got down on my knees and I I didn't know if I was praying, what I was doing. I just asked for help. I said I was done. I walked away from everything. And I continually work on myself every day. And um, I never look back. I remember my experiences. I talk about my experience. I validate the emotions that I went through but I use them as tools to continually push myself forward. I work with the most vulnerable people in Thunder Bay. Um, I work for people I don't feel that their voices are heard. They live on the streets and I speak up for them and I help them to get their housing. I help them into treatment, into detoxes. I help them leave, leave their own associations for a better life if they ask, right? I'm there to listen. I'm there to help, and I'm there to have no judgment because I know what it feels like. Having somebody like me that's gone through the same um, sort of things, right, that can identify with those feelings, that can identify with, you know, what they're going through, what they've gone through, and stands up in front of them and says, I'm here for you. I think that it's powerful, you know. I think that it uh, gives them hope. I couldn't be more proud. I, um, I'm very um, in awe. Uh, there was many days and months and years where I didn't know that we'd ever get here. Uh, didn't stop trying, but didn't know that we'd ever make it. Him and I, you know. And I'm very, uh, I'm in awe. I, I just, what he's, do, he is exactly where he should be. This is his plan. I mean, there's a reason that he didn't overdose. He, this is his plan. He's doing, he's exactly where he should be. Um, I work two jobs. <laughs> um, I'm engaged. I have a stepson. Um, I have a nice home, and I um, spend 12 hours a day working and giving, giving back to the streets. So this parking lot has houses, a dozen, two dozen people every night, uh, clients of mine that feel unsafe to stay in the shelters or they're not allowed to stay in the shelters, so they come in here and they stay in these cars. It's just really sad because winter's coming and they stay in here all winter. The ones that are essentially too far gone, those are my clients. Those are the people I want to help. I feel like I'm in this, I hang out with the same people. I just have a different role right now. And that role, is to help them, to believe in them, to lift them up, to make them not feel alone, to show them that they have a choice. <laughs>